Amen? Thank you, sister. Make me cry before I get up here. It's just wrong. Worship team, thank you for, uh, for that time that we've had today of praise through music. Uh, sister, thank you so much for singing that. I, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I asked sister to sing that because it sets up where we're going today. It sets up our condition before Jesus. If you were listening to the words in the song, if you know this scripture, you know that she talks about her life before Jesus. And then her life coming to Jesus. And then her life after. And, and what a great picture and what a great reminder for us. That let's not forget. We, we, we looked at that in Sunday school today. Sometimes we can... Uh, get a little spiritually minded and we look down our spiritual noses at other people and we need to be careful that we don't do that because then we can become Pharisees and, and we don't want to do that, right? So let's remember where he's brought us from, where he's taking us and where we're going. Amen? Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 17 and we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 19. Again, that's Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. If you're using an electronic device, you know the rule. You have to make the flipping pages sound, right? Just to humor me so that I know you're not reading text messages or emails or whatever. Let's read the verse together. Verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. We're looking at a verse that's probably real familiar with us. Uh, in our Sunday school class, we've been going through the book of Luke. I asked Pastor Mark this morning, when did you start teaching this book? It was before we started coming to the church. He's thinking maybe one and a half, two years ago, something like that. I reminded him he's on a good pace. John MacArthur, as he was preaching through the book of Luke, took 10 years. 10 years with one book, okay? So Master... Pastor Mark, he's on fire. So for those of you that are complaining he's taking too long, he's, he's cruising right along, okay? This story that we're looking at today is unique to the book of Luke. We don't see it in any of the other gospel accounts. I asked my kids this last week, what do you guys know about this story? And they answered, I think like many of us would answer, well, we need to be thankful, right? That's the point of the story, isn't it? Well, that's definitely one of the truths that we see in the story, but I don't believe that it's the main truth or the, or the big takeaway point from this text. So let me tell you where we're going today. I want you to be able to see three things by the end of our message today. Number one, our condition before Jesus. And when I say before Jesus, I mean before knowing Jesus, what is our condition? Two, our posture before Jesus. And now I'm talking about, I know him, I have a relationship with him, what's the posture that I take before him? And then number three, our faith in Jesus. Number three is tied directly into number two, it's also tied into number one, but our faith in Jesus. That's going to be a huge thing. If you heard the songs that were sung today, if you heard some of the words, we talked about faith. And faith is, a, faith is an important thing that sometimes I think we overlook. It's been said that faith is only as good as the object that it's placed in. 
I put my faith in this stand up here. I have no idea what's underneath it. But week after week, I see Pastor Mark, and I see Pastor Jim, and I see others come up here. So I have a pretty good faith or some trust that it's going to support my weight. That's what we're talking about. What are we putting our faith in? Will it support your weight? Will it support who you are? Will it support your beliefs? I pray that it does. So let's dig in here and let's see what the scripture tells us. A little background on the book of Luke for those of you who haven't been with us in Sunday school. Um, Pastor Mark's been doing a great job of just walking us through, you know, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And, and boy, there's so much in the book of Luke. Paul calls Luke the beloved physician. You can see that in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. Luke was actually a historian. It was his job to, to take notes and to write these things down and to make an accurate account. Now, we believe that this is God's word, right? And we believe that he wrote down what he was supposed to write down. But I'll tell you what, he made sure to cross every T and dot every I. He didn't want anything written down that wasn't supposed to be written down. So his, his going back and checking and, and verifying accounts, it was pretty intense. Luke also wrote the book of Acts. The book of Luke is actually the largest of the four gospel accounts that we have. When you put Luke and Acts together, that makes up more than one third of the New Testament just in sheer volume. The focus of Luke or the overarching theme in Luke is the plan of God. The plan of God is revealed in human history through Israel, through, the church, through Christ, and through the church. That's kind of the overarching theme or the overarching idea that we see throughout the book of Luke. The main character in the book of Luke? Jesus. When you don't know the answer to the question whenever you're at church or Sunday school, just say Jesus because it's usually the right answer, right? Jesus is the main character. Luke takes super care to really show what Jesus does and, and how he interacts and how he teaches his disciples and how he ministers to the people. Luke wants to make sure that we see that. Luke demonstrates through his writing Jesus' great concern for women, for children, for the poor, and for the disreputable. I had to look that word up. I, I kind of had an idea what it meant, but I wanted to make sure disreputable those who are not considered to be respectable in character or appearance I think that ties us back to our number one point our condition before Jesus speaking for myself before I knew Jesus that would be where I would be that's that's the group that I would be hanging out with is the disreputable ones I wouldn't be considered a person of character. And if we see ourselves rightly, all of us should kind of put ourselves in that, in that group. Amen? We see also in the book of Luke, a large portion of the book, almost 10 chapters, is focused on the journey of Jesus to the cross. We see from chapter 9, verse 51... All the way up to chapter 19, verse 44, we see Luke writing about the journey to Jerusalem. This final journey that Jesus is taking. His final teaching opportunities for his disciples. So that's kind of where we pick up our story. We're right in the middle of it. Chapter 17. So let's look at that scripture again. Let's read those first two, those first two scriptures, 11 and 12. It says, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. Stop right there. <clears throat> These ten lepers, their location to where they're at lines up with what scripture tells us where lepers should be. Lepers shouldn't be down on Franklin Street. And lepers shouldn't be over here on college, but they should be out there on County Road 25 somewhere, right? 
they don't come into town. You, you need to get out of town and you need to go be out there and take your leprosy with you. I'm going to ask you to do something. Turn to Leviticus. I know that we don't normally do that, but I'm going to ask you to turn to Leviticus chapter 13. I want you to see two verses. Wow, look at the dust fly out of those Bibles. Just kidding. Leviticus 13, verses 45 and 46. So here's some pages flipping everyone there. Verse 45 says, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. While you're there, kind of look at chapter 13 in Leviticus. Maybe turn a page back if you need to. Turn a page forward. Look at, look at chapter 14. Look at all the writing that's there. This is all strictly about leprosy. Laws for cleaning, laws for cleaning the houses, laws for taking care of the clothes. What do we do when we have somebody who has this disease? All these laws are here. And then how do we pronounce them clean? What's very interesting is how leprosy is looked upon much like sin. A Bible teacher by the name of R.C. Sproul commenting on this he says the key principle in Bible times in identifying if a skin disease is unclean is whether the skin seems to be rotting away, suggesting the spiritual principle of death, much like sin. So the person had to be excluded from camp, but they were excluded from camp not to protect the health of the people, or the health of Israel, but the reason that they were excluded from camp was because God was in the camp. God was in the camp. We need to get rid of the death. Death needs to be gone because God is here. If we're saying that death and sin are, are tied together, we know that God can't be in the presence of that, right? So that's, that was kind of their thinking of what leprosy was, and that's why they said, you got to go. I believe that this gives us a good snapshot of our condition before knowing Jesus. Dead. Dead in our sins. I like listening to Christian radio with my kids, and one day uh, a man was given an analogy and my kids did swim club this last year and they said, well, Jesus is like the proverbial lifeguard that as you're drowning and you barely have your hand ha hanging up there, he comes and he rescues you. And I told my kids, that's wrong. That's wrong. You were dead at the bottom of the pool. There was no heartbeat. There was no hand being raised. Jesus, I've down picked you up, drug you out, and then gave you new life. That's a better picture. And of course my kids are like, oh dad. <laughs> right? They're so theologically wrong, you know, just at times. But that's our picture before we know Jesus. Before we know Jesus, we are dead. We're rotting in our sins. There's no cure. There's, there's nothing able to fix us except Jesus. We can't fix ourselves. I can't read all the how-to books and the self-help books and listen to all the great you-are-good kind of guys, right? And fix myself. I just can't do it. The Bible tells me it's impossible. The Bible says that I'm a sinner. The Bible says that I need Jesus. It was asked of Spurgeon, why do you keep preaching on this needing Jesus? Why do you keep preaching that you must be born again? And he says, because you must be born again. 
I'm going to keep preaching on that till my last day because that's what you need. So what is leprosy? We see it here in the text. Maybe we know about it, maybe we don't. Uh, I went to the authority to make sure I understood it, and that's Google, because Google knows everything about everything. But Google does give us a good definition of it, and it says that leprosy is a chronic, curable, infectious disease, mainly causing skin lesions and nerve damage. Now, doctors, you'll have to excuse me. I'll probably mispronounce most of this right here. But leprosy is caused by infection with the bacterium Mycobacterium leprae. It mainly affects the skin, eyes, nose, peripheral nerves. Symptoms include light-colored or red skin patches with reduced sensation, numbness, weakness, and hands and feet. In the United States, it's very rare. In 2015, there were only 63 cases reported. The sad thing is, is it's still very prevalent in other countries where they don't have access to the necessary medicines due to lack of financing. It's spread by airborne respiratory droplets by coughing or sneezing. I don't recommend this, but if you want to get a visual, go to Google type in leprosy and click on the images and your heart will be broken. You'll see children, you'll see men, you'll see women, you'll see lots of people in a physical state that people shouldn't be. And it's uh, heartbreaking. My daughter asked me, we were talking about it and then she's all, can I see this? And she trusts me enough when I asked her, do you think you want it? And she said, no. And I'm glad she didn't. Because the, the images of, of the people with, with this leprosy, it's, it's hard to see. Many people think that one of the symptoms is that you're going to lose your fingers or you're going to lose a hand or, or a foot. But that's, limbs don't just fall off. But the nerve endings die. So they can't feel that they're in pain. They don't know that they're wounded. They don't know that something's happened. So then usually what happens is gangrene invades and then that's when the limbs fall off. Stories are told of a, of a man cooking over an open fire and his potato falls and he just reaches down there and picks it up and puts it back on the, on the grill because he doesn't feel the pain. Um, another man, a story is told of another man that's just washing his face every day with hot water but he doesn't realize that it's scalding hot water. And he blinds himself just by, just by washing his face. Man breaks his ankle. Huh, I'm walking different. Oh, well, I guess I just walk different now. Doesn't understand that something's associated to, to, the, to this outcome, right? People are still placed in leper colonies in places such as India, China, and Africa. You can go and be with these other people like yourselves, but you can't be around everyone else. That's a good picture of sin, right? Sin, sin tries to get you away from the community. Sin tries to move you into somewhere that you don't need to be. It's a tough thing. Leprosy can and often does affect the larynx, your, your voice box. Speech is impaired. Go back to Luke 17, verse 13, uh, our text for today. It says in 13, it says, And they lifted up their voices, saying, lifted up their voices. What did that sound like? With impaired vocal cords. With an impaired way of speaking, how did they lift up their voices? We see a difference because later on, and we've read it, later on it says that one comes back and he praises God with a loud voice. So there's a difference, right? They're, they're lifting up their voices, but it might not be much more than a whisper. But they're crying out. But I think what's more important than the volume is the words that they use. Look at the words that they use. They call Jesus Master. And they, they call him 
Somehow they know what to call him. Maybe they've seen other miracles happen. Maybe they've seen their friends get, get cured because Jesus was doing this, right? Jesus was going along and teaching and healing and, and the word was spreading like wildfire. And maybe they were witness to this. But they know somehow to call him master. This is a title that is usually only used by his followers. Master, somebody with notable authority or notable power. These ten lepers believe that Jesus can, that he has the ability to heal them. And what do they ask for? They ask for healing. Well, no. They ask for mercy. They ask for mercy. One definition of mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. I've heard it said that the mercy of God is not getting what you deserve. They didn't want this leprosy to run its course. Jesus was their only chance. They wanted it to stop. And they cried out for mercy. Look at verse 14. When he saw them. Interesting. As they're crying out, we don't see that Jesus is responding to their, to their voice, but the scripture says that when he saw them, when he looked at them, then he does something. We see throughout all the gospel accounts that Jesus shows compassion. That he has compassion to those that are hurting. And it's usually when he looks upon them. When he looks upon them and he sees their state, where they're at, it's when he has compassion on them. Not always, but he, he does that quite a bit, right? We see that Jesus looks upon them and he has compassion towards them. And he tells them to go and show yourselves to the priest. Turn back just a couple pages. Turn to the book of, right, st still in the book of Luke, chapter 5, verse 12. Here's another account of Jesus healing a leper. Here we have one leper. A little bit different story. Chapter 5, verse 12. It says that while he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand, touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof. Jesus doesn't go around the law, but Jesus stays within the law, right? He, he says that this is something that we need to do. You need to go and you need to show yourself to the priest to show that you've been healed. And that's actually where he starts off with these ten guys. He tells them to go and show yourself. He hasn't healed them yet. Go and show yourselves to the priest. He's testing their faith. Are you willing to put your faith and your trust in me? Are you willing to do what I've asked you to do? Are you willing to go where I've told you to go? And we don't know <clears throat> what, what they're thinking, what's in their mind. They might just be thinking, well, what's the worst that's going to happen to us? We're going to get stoned. We're going to get killed. We'll probably, that's probably a better place than where we're at right now. But they go. We see that they go. What did they have to lose? Their pride? Their dignity? That was gone a long time ago. Now look at the second part of verse 14. It says, And as they went, they were cleansed. 
Don't rush past that. That's a miracle. That's a miracle of Jesus times 10. Right? 10 guys he cleansed like that. And it wasn't because he put his hand on him. It was because he spoke something. And then after they responded, by going along the way, right on time, they were cleansed. Wow. Where's my brother from Sunday school? Wow, right brother? We, we come to these teachings sometimes and that's all we can say is, wow. Blows you away. We now come to kind of a pivotal point in this story. Verse 15. Then one of them. Then one of them. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. This ties into point number two. Look at his posture before Jesus. They were all healed. They probably saw the healing in the other before they saw it in themselves as they were walking along. <gasps> hey, look at Mark. That thing's gone off his forehead. Right? And then they probably, wow. And this came up in our Sunday school class, but can you fault the other nine for going? Because the other nine were doing what they were told. But one, but one, he, he had to give so much more thanks. He couldn't just go to the priest and, and, and say, here I am, check me off your, your, you know, your thumbs down list. I'm clean now, right? There was so much more that he had to do. So do, so do you see how this is so much more than just a story of being thankful? That it's not just a story of make sure you, make sure you say thanks. When you get something, make sure you say thanks. But we see the Samaritan's heart when he sees what has happened. Although he's been told to go, he can't. He has to come back. He understands somehow that the one who sent him is so much more. And he's compelled to come back. And not only to give thanks, but to fall on his face. And to submit by the word that we used earlier, which was master. He just falls on his face and just... He assumes the posture of a disciple at the feet of Jesus. He assumes the posture of a worshiper at the feet of Jesus. Do you see that? One more time, turn back to Luke 7, chapter 7, verse 36. Now, sister did a great job singing about it, but you need to see it out of your Bible right here. The title that's in my Bible, it says, A Sinful Woman Forgiven. Verse 36, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And wiped them with the hair of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet... He would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. 
Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Wow. Sorry for my lack of vocabulary, but wow. Do you understand what we're seeing here? Do you understand the story? She sees her condition. She postures herself correctly at the feet of Jesus. And she puts her faith in Jesus. We spoke about it this morning in our Sunday school. There has to be a time of repentance. You, you have faith, but you also have to have a time of repentance when you see that, man, I've been, I've been doing some junk. I've been doing some wrong things. And Jesus, I need you to change me. It's not that I came to an awareness because I was reading the latest self-help book and... Dr. So-and-so says, you know, you need to come to this awareness and then take a shower and you're good. It doesn't work like that. You need to have an awareness of your sin. You need to posture yourself, posture yourself before Jesus and put your faith and your trust in Him. And repentance needs to be a part of that. Amen? Amen. Go back to Luke 17. Our time is slipping away. You guys need to, I said this last time, but you guys need to listen faster. Luke 17, verse 17. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Using today's Vernacular, I think Jesus would say that he's a little, a little angry, right? He's still teaching his disciples, and he wants them to be aware that, where are the other nine? Shouldn't they too have come back and given thanks? Why, why do we only have this one here? He was a little bent, wasn't happy, right? And then verse 19. I believe this is, this is the point of the story right here. Verse 19. He says, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. That's actually somewhat of a poor translation. The, the actual closest translation from the original Greek would be, your faith has saved you. We saw that with the woman, right? He says that your faith has saved you. We see that here also because... Don't forget, ten were cleansed, but only one is saved. Ten followed the instructions, but only one came back to the instructor. Ten were healed, but only one came back to know the healer. This one, he has a different kind of faith. It's a different kind of faith. They all showed a level of faith by going. Jesus said, go, and they all went, right? Right? But this one has a different kind of faith by returning. We see that this one places his trust in Jesus when maybe he didn't totally understand everything. He just knew, this guy healed me. And there was some kind of a burning desire to come back and to not only give thanks, but to fall on his face. He is acting upon what he does know. Faith. He knows, that he, he knows that Jesus has healed him 
And he wants to thank him, but he wants to do that above and beyond more than what words can express. He wants to submit all that he is to Jesus. So now we're at the point in the sermon where we're going to switch from us and them and we're going to switch to you. So let's take our three points and let's turn them into three questions. Do you understand your condition before Jesus? Do you know that you need to be saved from your sins? That's a question for each one of us. Number two, what posture do you take before Jesus? Is it one of a disciple? Is it one of a worshiper? Or do you shake your fist at it? And do you tell him, my will be done. I don't care about your will. I want my will done. Then number three, can you point to a time in your life where you know that you know that you know that you put your faith and trust in Jesus? Because if you have, you should be able to. And if you haven't, or if you can't point to that time in your life, and I don't need to know the date, and I don't need to know the hour, but there should be a time where you can say, I came to an understanding of my need for Jesus. I came to an understanding of what he's done. And now I'm asking him to have mercy on me. I'm asking him to have mercy on me. There needs to be that time. There's a, a Bible teacher by the name of Wayne Grudem. He's got a He's got a book, An Introduction to Biblical Doctrine. It's about that big. I don't know how many pages. It's ridiculous. But what he says is that saving faith, knowledge alone, it's not enough. Approval of Scripture, that's not enough. You must decide to depend on Jesus to save you personally. That's what it takes. Saving faith is trust in Jesus Christ as a living person for forgiveness of sins and for eternal life with God. So what is required? We, we've already talked about it. And, and Wayne Grudem talks about it in this book. He says, repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is a heartfelt sorrow for sin. A renouncing of it and a sincere commitment to forsake it and to walk in obedience to Christ. Have you done that? Have you done that? If not, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that Jesus has opened your eyes so that you know and so that you can know him so that you can posture yourself at his feet as a disciple as a worshiper today is the day you will never truly take on the posture of a disciple or a worshiper unless you repent and put your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone and if you've done that amen praise the Lord but it's also not a one time event something that we need to come back to. Something that we need to come back to. Because our hearts, the further we stay away from God, the more our hearts get hard. The more we fill up our mind and our soul and everything that we are in other stuff. And he says, come back to me. Come back and worship. So if you're here today, and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, but maybe you're, maybe you're far away from Him. I don't know. Maybe it's time to make a course correction and turn back to Him. Seeking His will and walking in His truths. Amen? Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for you. We thank you so much, Father, that you show yourself to us through your word. Father, may, may the words of your book penetrate the lives of these people. Father, may the truths that we see change our lives. As we sang earlier, Father, may we trust and obey for there's no other way. Father, we, we ask that you would seal some things in our heart. We ask, God, that you would convict where conviction needs to happen. And Father, that you would just minister where that needs to happen as well. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for his obedience to you. And God, that we can know you through Jesus. We thank you for that gift. We pray and we believe and we ask all these things in his name. Amen. James has reminded us that we are saved by faith.